taking uh, just for instance the Maslow hierarchy of needs and turning it on its end to keep us in uh, focused on our basic needs so we can't reach those higher levels and, and so how do we fight that integrated system because they've uh, they've taken all the major power companies consolidated them and, and integrated those agenda we were talking earlier about some of the interlocked boards yeah that that's a really good point because Oftentimes people look at the failures of the system and say, oh, the people in charge must be really incompetent or stupid or something. And, and you, you know, your programs there have done a good job of actually showing that these people are very shrewd, they're very dedicated, and they got a ton of money in their think tanks. But what they've been doing in their think tanks, obviously, is analyzing, okay, what are all the major sectors of human endeavor and how can we take them over in order that we can destroy people and consolidate, I mean, destroy uh, in so many people's lives consolidate wealth for ourselves and then control people. Well, we're doing just the opposite. We're taking the same whole systems approach, realizing that all these sectors fit together, but we're, we're coming at it looking to see how can we em empower people at the individual level and then create the new systems. As the old systems are crumbling down, either intentionally or just through their own corruption, as they're coming down, we need to be emerging the new systems that are based on integrity and based on personal freedom, but also where the sectors are all are they're all covered and they're all in touch with one another. So that's why I'm thrilled to see that this same model that works so well in in stopping this initiative to spray, uh, you know, seven million people in Northern California for ten years with with poison out of an airplane. That was a George W. Bush Jr. Uh, a personal earmark with three hundred million dollars in the first year dedicated to doing this thing that a, a group of citizens especially once the moms got involved and started coming to the demonstrations you know with their kids in strollers basically saying no way you're gonna dump poison on my on my kids you know th this model with all the the creativity and expertise that got freed up was able to stop that whole uh, onslaught in six months and I'm confident that this same sort of model, which is so efficient in organizing people's uh, initiative and creativity like a laser as opposed to just a, you know, a, a, a flashlight, I, I'm confident that when this sort of organization spreads around the world, that, uh, and it already is, but I just got back last weekend from uh, sharing this model with a National Occupy Summit up, up in Olympia, and they were very excited by the organizational implications because they're they're dealing with so many different issues and struggling as to how to organize it and coordinate them. So it's this sort of activity and just the initiative of, of just millions and millions of people across the planet waking up right now that actually have me being more confident than I've been in the last 15 years that we can turn this thing around. Yeah, and I, I just want to add that, you know, um, Thrive as a movie is also, you know, we think of it, it's almost like a trailer for the website, thrivemovement.com, where you can explore all of these solution strategies and learn about success stories as well as see the movie or share it or do any of the research. We have a resource tree there that um, has all of the books, videos, organizations, and people that we use to get informed Um so it's really a resource for people um, to understand what's happening, but also to realize how much there is going on that is working and how effective people can be once they figure out what's happening and organize with that information. So it's more leveraged in, in how they're focusing their time and energy. So thrivemovement.com is like the whole other half of the offering. Right. And I love the questions you bring up in the film, because on the one hand, you've got the level where it's the 99 percent. You mentioned the Occupy movement. On the other hand, you clearly identify we have to have individual rights. We have to have a respect for documents like the Bill of Rights. Uh, that's very important to where we need to go from here. If we leave that behind, we lose it all. Uh, now, I want to turn. I, I don't want to mean to do a sense of the father thing, but just to make an example of Procter and Gamble, because that's where you come from. We've got a lot of challenges there, too. You've got the Clarence J. Gamble legacy of being part of eugenics and really coercively hurting people. You guys are trying to turn that question around and empower people, which I think is obviously the right question. How do we deal with issues that you have uh, current members of the Procter & Gamble board working with Monsanto when obviously that's one of our big problems? Yeah, well, I appreciate the question actually a lot. I, 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 I like having the chance to address this directly. But let me kind of take those one at a time. 
Uh, first of all, in, in terms of Clarence Gamble, uh, this is a, a person that I, I did meet a, a few times and actually really enjoyed him a lot. He was one of the most innovative members of, of the family. And I was shocked when I read David Icke and then saw Endgame to see he, uh, how he was characterized uh, as, um, a, uh, as someone who was actively uh, and covertly depopulating. Because I know he was associated with the eugenics movement, and that's uh, unfortunate in those times. I c communicated with his whole side of the family once I heard the, these reports and said, is this true that he was involved in any kind of mandatory or covert sterilization? Uh, and they said no. As far as the, any of them knew, he was never himself. Uh, in fact, he was a fighter against mandatory sterilization, even though he was very much in favor of spreading uh, the optional birth control and so forth to you know, 30 countries uh, around the world. So I, I don't know definitively, but that's as best I could find out from the family. But in any case, whatever he was involved in, obviously, each one of us is our own human beings. And, and as we say in the, in the film, uh, there, there's no more dangerous plot on the planet right now than the, the elite plot to actively depopulate uh, the, the planet. And so we're doing everything we can to expose that. So now in relation to Procter & Gamble itself, uh, I personally um, am very grateful to my ancestor who was a, a candle maker and a soap maker um, for the legacy that he passed on to me, which is just enough money to spend my life tracking these very questions and then making a film to try to do everything I, I could about it. But the company itself was one that I, when I, as I've read about the history, and none of us, none of the family members have been involved in the running of the company for several generations. And our stock ownership is so minuscule that we have no financial leverage as such over the company. But we do have a little bit of kind of public leverage because if a bunch of us come forward as the, the members of the legacy family, um, against one of their policies. It's embarrassing for them. So we've been able to have some success in, in coercing them to reduce um, pollution and especially to, to uh, eliminate animal testing. We've gotten them to eliminate over 90 percent of what they were doing. Uh, we're, we're working on the, the last five to 10 percent of that. And we continue to do what we can. I wish we could do more. Uh, I'm no longer proud of that company. I don't use any of their products except an occasional uh, razor blade. They've been unwilling to go into organic uh, foods. And, and um, you know, when, when, when they cooperate with Monsanto, when they create a RFID chips, um, when Dick Cheney goes on the board in, in the 90s, you know, for me, that was the indication, of, okay, they really have, unfortunately, given their size, um, they have become... Uh, at least to some degree, a part of the military-industrial complex, which is so dangerous uh, right now. So uh, I, I don't uh, have any uh, hesitation about exposing any uh, violations that, that they create. And I, I reach out uh, to other members of legacy families to do everything we can in our generations to uh, turn those giant ships away from the kind of of centralized control and, and inappropriate violating behavior that a lot of them do uh, and either you know get rid of them or turn them so that they're actually really uh, serving people on the planet in a healthy way. Yeah, and I, I think I want to add, I, I think one of the things that we feel is that individuals should be prosecuted for the decisions that they make and not be able to hide behind the, the corporate personhood. So you know, inquiry needs to be made. And we can tell, I mean, clearly Procter & Gamble's involved in some horrible stuff. And the individuals responsible for those decisions, I think, we think, should be prosecuted. So, you know, that's part of the whole move here is that uh, there needs to be some accountability as their structures come down and um, the people reemerge, which I'm confident will happen. And one of the ways I think is to get this corporate personhood thing out of the way so that the people are actually accountable for the decisions they make, and including investors in those companies. If that's what their money's doing, then there should be accountability there, too. Right. Yeah, let me mention one more aspect of that, because in our solutions process, our, our model, it's not just a useful structure, but the other half of it is it, it needs to be based on healthy principles. 
And the key principle that we have, that we base all of our solutions on is the principle of non-aggression, of the honoring of each person's uh, property, uh, safety, uh, and privacy. So when, uh, when these companies are doing bad things, not only do they need to be prosecuted, but we can employ the same thing that Gandhi uh, and King did with nonviolent non-participation. We can refuse to, to buy from these companies. We can refuse to invest in these companies. We can protest against these companies. And we can divest from other companies or organizations or universities or whatever that also, that also invest them in the same way that, that, in, that divestment was so critical to, to getting rid of apartheid, at least to what degree it has been in, in South Africa. The same thing can be true for the multinational corporations and the banks in America and you know, across the developed world. Right, and obviously this was never just about Procter & Gamble. The real problem is that all these major companies have more or less combined into one larger entity. And what I really see is the big problem is the Rockefeller Foundation or the Gates Foundation saying, everybody pool your money with us, we have the answers. But their answers are, are the harmful GMOs and very questionable, definitely dangerous vaccinations. And that's not the path forward. Uh, I do appreciate all the questions you put forward in Thrive. Let me bring this up, too, because uh, the environmental component is something we do want, quote, sustainable energy. At the same time, you've got the world government level, the United Nations and what have you, uh, also addressing those questions. And they've got a real Trojan horse where they want to use the global commons to get a greater power, uh, something that we all are interested in solving, but not the same solution. Yeah, that's a really critical distinction. I'm glad that you brought that one up, Aaron, because uh, I know a lot of my friends uh, who are who care deeply about the environment and have been very uh, active uh, for years uh, have been being severely duped, as I used to be, to think that the that the Copenhagen conference, for instance, was really about saving the environment rather than a Trojan horse in order to create. Uh, a global tax and a global government and a global police force to, in fact, control everybody through the control of carbon. And it's the same thing with, with the, you know, a lot of people are still being fooled, including here in Santa Cruz, by programs like Agenda 21, where they, they learn to use all the right words like, you know, uh, equality and sustainability uh, and enduring systems and all that, that type of thing. But really, if you look at it under the guise of that, they're stretching the tentacles of the one world government and the super state structure right down into your local communities and taking over uh, your, uh, your environment, your water, the, the, the air, the local systems, the local governments and so forth under the guise of uh, taking care of the environment. And we really need to wake up and make a more mature and discerned uh, distinction there before it's too late. Yeah, and I think it's important to reclaim a lot of that language for ourselves rather than abdicate because they've mm -hmm. usurped it. I mean, they had the Clean Air Act. You know, I remember, you know, in our choice of in making Thrive, talking about love was like, geez, can we do that? You know, it's like, wait a minute, what happened here? You know, how is it there, there are these words, whether they have to do with sustainability or clean air or basic human goodness and the capacity that we have to love and care for each other, you know, suddenly those become, you know, risque things to talk about or we're going to be misunderstood instead of let's reclaim this and say, yes, we're absolutely for sustainability of a conscious, aware um, nature that in that is based in individual um, freedom. Right. And so I guess my final question would be this in two parts. A, which free technology energies are the most promising? I've read a lot on these inventors. Uh, we get emails about it constantly. I know people out there have looked into this. What's going to be at our homes, on our individual properties in the coming future? The second part is you could have, you know, theoretically the spaceship with the future civilization and all the answers on board. The problem is I don't see my ticket onto that system because there's effectively a scientific dictatorship in place, and those seats have already been reserved by people who think they own the future. Yeah. They, uh, first of all, in terms of the devices, um, there's a man named Sterling Allen who runs a website uh, called PESWiki, P-E-S, Pure Energy Systems Wiki, 
and uh, they really stay on top of what's emerging, at least publicly. There are there are tons of private, you know, secret labs because unfortunately there still have to be where they're not going public until they're they're really ready.